Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is English's celebration of ASU Homecoming and well, welcome you to the 2017 Homecoming Writing Awards. I'm Kevin Sandler, I'm chair of the Homecoming Committee and also the director of the Film and Media Studies program. And let me just give you a little bit of a background about the awards. They were established 10 years ago in 2007 at the request of Randall McGraw-Helms, some of you may know, who is now an emeritus professor in the Department of English. And the awards are funded uh, by donors to the department's scholarship account. And we thank all the donors for contributing uh, to help make these awards possible. The awards are given in three categories, poetry, short story slash creative nonfiction, and scholarly essay. And we want to give thanks to all the judges that uh, helped make the determinations. We also want to thank uh, Brad Reiner for organizing the submission process. Thank you, Brad. Uh, the contest here garners many, many submissions for uh, uh, most of any of our awards and scholarships uh, that is presented in the Department of English, so it's quite difficult to choose uh, the winners. So let me just announce uh, quickly our winners. Uh, they are in poetry, Sianna Garrison for Little Universe, uh, for scholarly essay, Maddie Margolis for Choosing Not to Choose, Paradoxes in Barleby, and for short story, creative nonfiction, with the winner being in fiction, uh, for, to Jordan Oxer for Exam One, Sons of Mars. So first, we are going to uh, have a presentation. Uh, each winner is going to uh, give, a, give a presentation, and that presentation is going to be in poetry, by Sienna Garrison, and she'll be doing it uh, by Skype. So <laughs> let's welcome Sienna. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so as he said, my poem is called Little Universe. Um, whenever you guys are ready, I'm going to go ahead and read an excerpt from it. We are ready. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right. In the still heat, I plucked their spiny bodies from the leaves, bright orange and purple creatures feasting on our passion vine. To save the shriveling plant, my mom threatened insecticide, so I plopped them in a glass jungle and mothered them. One after another, they began to cocoon, to retreat inside themselves like little hermits, spinning fibers of silk, intricate armor for a languorous exodus. Each morning, I buried my worries in their verdant wings, still wet as I slipped my hand as scaffolding into the fortress of glass and vine. Some clung to my palm hesitant to thud, others left at the chance of freedom. But they never left. They swarmed still in the front garden, performing aerial acrobatics, soaring and gliding, resting fluorescent wings loving and mating, draining the nectar of those violet flowers, their tiny universe converging with mine. And I watched as all at once beauty emerged and died. And that's it. <laughs> Can Sienna see us? She can, yes. So here is your certificate of recognition. <laughs> we will mail it to you. <laughs> Next up, uh, the winner for scholarly essay is Maddie Margolis for Choosing Not to Choose Paradoxes in Barley. So I picked out just a couple of paragraphs to read, just going to hit the highlights. Um, but yeah, like he said, my essay was called Choosing Not to Choose, Paradoxes in Bartleby. In his 1853 short story, Herman Melville presents the enigma that is Bartleby. This character never speaks of his past, and in fact, rarely speaks at all, except to degree his preference not to do anything. Bartleby is only made more perplexing by his contradictory nature. He draws powerful passivity and acts solely to maintain his inaction. However, Bartleby's character is not the story's only source of contradictions. 
Throughout Melville's Bartleby, incongruities pervade considerations of sovereignty, epistemology, and the right to revolution. By passively refusing to yield to the narrator's request, for instance, Bartleby inverts assumed hierarchies and gains sovereignty over his boss. This instance of undermining authority manifests itself epistemologically, calling the narrator's reliability into question. However, the same passivity that initially affords Bartleby sovereignty later leads to Bartleby's loss of agency when he bases his personal revolution on inaction. The story's construction as a social satire reflects these paradoxes in sovereignty through its commentary on capitalism. Finally, changes to the endings, narrative perspective, and level of humor in the 2001 and 1977 film adaptations of Bartleby reinforce and transform these themes. Overall, because lasting sovereignty depends on taking control, Bartleby forfeits his sovereignty when he founds his acts of defiance and passivity, communicating the loss of agency that results from inaction. Throughout the text, Bartleby supports, subverts authority through his passive phrasing, allowing him to move towards sovereignty through inaction. As the employer, the narrator appears to have sovereignty over Bartleby and the other scriveners. However, Bartleby undermines this authority through the subtle resistance that passivity entails. The narrator, for example, demands clarification after Bartleby declines to examine a paper, asking him, you will not? However, Bartleby corrects, I prefer not. Rather than blatantly refusing to work and challenge the status quo, Bartleby establishes his sovereignty through a more ambiguous and understated manner. By framing his inaction as a preference, Bartleby deflates the significance of the task, making it seem more like a favor than an obligation. As a result, Bartleby appears calm and almost reasonable, as if forcing him to do something he would prefer not to would be unnecessarily imposing. This reversal fully manifests itself when Bartleby assumes authority over the narrator, preferring not to admit the narrator into his own office. The narrator acknowledges, with his cadaverously gentlemanly nonchalance, yet withal firm and self-possessed, he had such a strange effect upon me that incontinently I slunk away from my own door and did as desired. Bartleby's unassuming and almost apologetic refusal disarms the narrator, allowing Bartleby to subtly claim sovereignty. When he puts his own preferences above the orders of the boss, Bartleby undermines the hierarchy of the workplace. Although passivity initially allows Bartleby to gain sovereignty, it also takes away his agency in the end. Bartleby founds his revolution against the narrator on inaction. By refusing to act and participate in society, though, Bartleby cuts himself off from the other characters. The narrator ultimately concedes, it was his soul that suffered and his soul I could not reach. This isolation, however, does not preclude Bartleby from being subject to the forces of the outside world. Reflecting the dangers of passivity, the narrator ca cautions him, either you must do something or something must be done to you. Bartleby finds that the control that accompanies inaction is only provisional. When he does not act to maintain his sovereignty, he loses it. Accordingly, Bartleby succumbs to the will of others. He lets himself be taken to jail where he starves and dies. Unchecked, Bartleby's passive submission to the world around him prevents him from taking responsibility for his own life. Though Bartleby's refusal to act initially affords him sovereignty over the narrator, the same passivity forces Bartleby to forfeit his sovereignty, leaving him at the mercy of society. Thank you very much. Next up, the fiction winner in the short story creative nonfiction category is Jordan Oxer with exam one, Sons of Mars. There we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, pardon my voice, I'm just getting over a cough. A little context for my story, Sons of Mars, I formatted it as a multiple choice test. So the reading is gonna be odd, I'm gonna do each question and jumping around in the narrative because it's also sort of non-linear. Each letter, A, B, C, and D, stands for a different character. Alpha, Birdie, Cocktail, and Delano. And it's about um, a company of soldiers, four of them, in World War II. It tracks uh, their tour from the moment they hear news of the war to the moment it ends. Here we go. One, in what year did World War II begin? A, 1939. B, 1941. That's when I knew I did do something. C, I was drafted in 41, but I would started really paying attention the year before. My father had business connections in Paris he was worried about. D, long before any of us really knew what we were getting ourselves into, believe me. 
Two, where did the war begin? A, when my father showed me his medals. I was seven years old. He took me into his room and opened this great big wooden chest at the foot of the bed and took out an old rusted cigar case. His victory medal was my favorite. It had a woman on it, victory, he told me, wielding a sword and shield with stars above her crown that reminded me of Lady Liberty. I wanted one just like it. No, you don't, he'd said, looking at his pinned up pant leg. B. Well, see, this guy named Adolf Hitler thought he was hot stuff, so he took his army and walked right over Poland's border, thinking he could just take it. He lied and said they were spying or some shit, and good old Britain told him that enough was enough, and to get his ass out of Poland before they got to three. Well, they counted one, and he didn't move. Two, and he stayed right where he was. On three, Britain had no choice but to start a war on Hitler with all our best buddies. They call him the big dominoes, and buddy, let me tell you, you do not mess with a woman you just pissed off. C. My district was picked from the Selective Service Bowl. I was standing by the Cherrywood Zenith radio in my two-bedroom apartment. Uncle Sam said he wanted me, but I sure as hell didn't want to go. I was living a good life in the city. I had a good job lined up in father's textile business, a nice place to live near the park, enough money to be comfortable for a long while. But when Uncle Sam says he wants you, you can't say no without escaping to Canada. And I don't like the cold. D. I was picking up some apples, red ones, from Hart's Grocery when the news about Pearl Harbor hit the radio. I went straight to a payphone and called home. My mom worked as a nurse in the last big war. She said it starts when the first man is sent home. But I don't believe that. The conflict doesn't start after the first sight of blood. Nah, it starts long before that. When someone looks at someone else and thinks, try and stop me, I dare ya. Seven. What type of entertainment was popular in the US at this time? A. I'm not big on that kind of thing. I mean, sure, going to the picture show is great and all, but I never understood the appeal. Birdie whistles and cocktail sings. Getting tired of the same three songs, though. You can only hear over there so many times before you want to shoot your own ears off. B. The boys don't appreciate my whistling. I like singing more, but I know cocktails better than me, so I keep my yaps shut. Whistling, though? That's easy. Anyone can do it. Even our very own King Arthur. But he's got a stick so far up his ass, it'd be like playing a clarinet. <laughs> I do wish Cocktail would stop singing that damn Bugle Boy song. It makes Dell uncomfortable. C. The boys may think I'm stuffy, but I know good music. I got my jazz education when I snuck out at night as a kid to listen at the doors of seedy nightclubs and alleyways I should not have been in, especially not wearing the clothes I was. Damn, I could have been killed. But I was a listener. Couldn't help myself. Swing was popular at the dance clubs I went to. Those are Bertie's favorite. Not that he'd ever admit it. He whistles Benny Goodman often enough for us to figure it out on our own. If I had my trumpet, I don't know if I'd join in or beat him with it. D. My favorite was a serial called The Man Who Awoke. Read it when I was a kid. This guy keeps putting himself into suspended animation for 5,000 years, and every time he wakes up, he's in a whole new world. I wish I could be like that. Sleep away this whole war. Wake up somewhere new. The best one was when he wakes up and people can choose what they dream about. And almost everyone wants to sleep all the time. I don't think Artie would like that story. Cocktail said his favorite was the last one, the one about immortality. He thinks it would be boring too. Nine. Which of the following is something that was said to encourage the troops during times of duress? A. I've said some nasty things under stress. Not sure when Bertie will get over me telling him his girl back home wasn't waiting for him like he asked her to. Or if Delano will let go of the whole backwoods thing. But war has a way of forgiving you of the worst and letting others do the same. I practice my speeches at night when the rest of them are asleep and the men on watch have their backs to me. I borrow from people who are better than me. Presidents, generals, teachers. I never give them, so I don't know how much good it does. Perseverance comes up a lot. Courage. Our president once said that the only thing to fear is fear. I won't ever borrow that one, just a bunch of empty words. B. I get all warm and fuzzy inside when anyone in the company yells, Shut up, Bertie! It's like they really do love me. And while I do enjoy cocktail singing very much, it's Del who takes a lot of the mortal terror away. He's weird. I don't know if he snuck some tranquilizers with him or he's a few spoons short of a set, but he makes it seem less like hell. He knows what we can't talk about. You don't have to pretend to be soldiers around him. 
He needs to lighten the hell up, though, learn how to take a joke. C. Music keeps me going. I practice the fingering for my trumpet whenever I can, pressing down on the buttons in my shirt and bobbing my head to keep time. Arthur's impressive as hell, though. Keeps his distance, but he knows exactly what's wrong. He was there for Delano when he nearly scrubbed his hands raw with a tattered rag he found at a bombed out bar. He stands in front of Birdie whenever we have a mercy killing. He tells me he doesn't mind me singing my bugle song as long as it doesn't give away our position. In my heart of hearts, I know that man has a soft spot for Miss Fitzgerald. D. Cocktail's my best friend. He doesn't get why Birdie tells stories all the time, and I don't pretend to. But when Cocktail talks, it's like he's somewhere else. He taught me that awful Bugle Boy song, too. Says it's one of his favorites because it's like it was written just for him. I still don't like it much. Makes him laugh, but no one else finds it funny.